So, <clears throat> welcome. Let's talk about urban planning. What can be the role of academics in participatory climate action? Today, we chat with Connor Smith from the School of Geosciences at the University of Edinburgh to know more about an experimental methodology for academics to self-reflect on their approach to local climate action projects. We'll talk about the challenges faced in these grassroots initiatives in taking control of decision-making, the power dynamics involved, and to what extent is academic interference actually beneficial to the success of local climate action. Hi, Connor. Welcome to our episode. Hi, Jose. How are you doing? Uh, I guess I'll I'll start off by asking you uh, what drew you to explore this deeper understanding of academia's role in climate action initiatives. Well, to be honest, I think there's probably two parts to this answer. The first is personal. So the the project offered what was basically an exciting opportunity to participate in a in a project that look to actually implement climate action on the ground and people's ideas. So in that sense, it was potentially quite tangible in comparison to usual academic work where we're looking to just inform policy, et cetera. So yeah, it, it was potentially, it felt a little bit more exciting than a usual academic project. Um, but from a, a more professional point of view and thinking about the research gap, um, the, the kind of role of external experts helping to facilitate um, local climate action, or not even local climate action, climate action more broadly, is it's only increasing. And yet the evidence base of how, depending on who these researchers are, who we are as individuals, who we are as academics, that actually this is quite important and can influence the way that projects are run and the outputs that come out of them. So, yeah, we really wanted to focus in on that kind of research gap. And as I say, at the same time, there was just a personal motivation to try and support a local authority really delivering climate action rather than just planning it, I suppose, or visioning it. It was, um, yeah, potentially more tangible. And this, this endeavour that you speak about, uh, your article is based on your experiences, along with your colleagues, uh, working with mm -hmm. a local climate action project in Scotland along with the yeah. governing institution as well. So what were the main takeaways from your participation in these projects? And how did this experimental methodology that you write about help to reach uh, those conclusions? So the, the main findings really were that it's only half the story to frame public participation in local decision-making or decision-making more broadly as a set of processes that need to be attuned to diverse communities. So while that's undoubtedly true, what works in one place might not work in the next place. And you do have to kind of fit it and make sure it's and appropriate, both the activities, the recruitment strategy to get people involved, et cetera. But as I say, ultimately, that's only one half of the story. And the other half is that processes need to be underwritten, sorry, by certain enabling conditions. And what our methodology helped to draw out through our individual and collective reflections was that one of the, the main enabling conditions potentially is trust and building trust takes time. Maintaining trust means you need continuity, the, the, the kind of same people there or at least the same institution constantly doing it. And it's, it's an iterative process. And in the context of a greater role for publics in local decision making, trust also requires seeding power and our reflections revealed, well, well, what we think at least, is that external experts and academics aren't necessarily well-placed to do any of that, especially if operating within the context of a one-off project and quite demanding timescales, whereas the local authorities who are well-placed in theory um, actually in practice are operating in quite an unconducive landscape that makes it really challenging. And... Um... Going forward, um, how do you hope that these findings can instruct maybe people like you who are externally wanting to help and promote uh, these types of climate action and climate projects? Uh, what do you hope that this uh, study can instruct uh, these these actors? I, I'd hope that it shows that you shouldn't just do a project because the funding's there and because you've been asked to do it. You need to really reflect on if you're the right person, if you're the right team to be doing that. And yeah, it, th th there's going to be loads of things that, that weigh into that. And it's an individual decision for the people participating. But it, it seems to 
me and to my other co-authors that ultimately, in some cases, it could be a missed opportunity to cede more power, more responsibility to grassroots organisations, or otherwise trying to increase the capability of local authorities to be able to better embed more direct forms of democracy rather than lending capacity. And ultimately, it felt that even though it wasn't really what we aimed to do, we, we really just lent that capacity that the local authority didn't have themselves to do what they should have been doing. And even more critically, or a, an even more critical reflection, rather being that that potentially took away a role and responsibility of grassroots organisations, especially in one of our case studied locations where there was lots of social capital characterised by a load of really cool community organisations and local governance structures. And it did seem that in that case, yeah, that the community wanted the, 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 the role, they wanted the responsibility, they had the ambition, and maybe they would have been better placed to deliver on that, maybe supported by academics like ourselves, rather than us leading on the participation and uh, kind of deliberation aspect of the project. Mm. So this milestone that this study is in this kind of meta-analysis of uh, the action of academics in these contexts, do you feel like there is still stones to be turned in this, in this area? What research uh, would you think we could what direction we could go in for this to better inform ourselves on how to act uh, in these in these contexts? Um, to, to be honest, a little bit of a curveball there because I was thinking of future research more focused on local authorities and the kind of subnational funding mechanisms, programs, frameworks that need to be there to support them to be the intermediaries and place leaders on climate action that they can be. And, and, and that's really my main takeaway from it. With regards to future research, thinking about the, the kind of academic and expert angle that you've uh, alluded to there, um, I, I can speak to the methodology. So for, for example, the methodology, as you've touched on, involved the combination of individual and collective reflections, drawing on the different positionalities and social identities of the team members. And despite, and it worked really well, we were unsure if it was going to, it could have fallen flat on its face. It was quite experimental, not something we'd seen done often before. And it, it did happen to work and that diversity was great, but it was still conducted, the, the, the academic write-up by three white males. And therefore I think a greater diversity in the people contributing the individual and collective reflections had really helped to give more of a, well-rounded and holistic and just more insightful and, and, and nuanced look at it. So that's more of a research limitation, I suppose, but addressing that limitation could also be an avenue for future research. Yeah, absolutely. And um, while working uh, with these people and in these projects, what was the thing that struck you uh, the most? Were you expecting the outcome that you arrived to when you came in? Well, I mean, maybe you were really excited to come in and then you came out feeling like an outsider. Maybe you didn't expect that. How did that come about? What was the like the biggest uh, yeah. unexpected thing that happened in that process? See, that re really good question. I think at a high level, the outcome potentially wasn't too different to what we expected, but then more granularly and just all the nuances of, of what happened. What was really striking was that whether it was the, the the local people, the businesses, the local authority, everyone has the ambition. Everyone wants to see their places better, safer for their kids, more environmentally friendly, uh, uh, addressing climate crisis. So the ambition, it is there. Um, and ultimately, it's, it's these enabling conditions and, and this wider context within which it sits that needs to be worked on. And we need to learn more about and, and, and do more about more on um so, so yeah i suppose on, on the one hand really positive to see all this energy all this real just yeah the positivity and hope for a better future but then at the same time gives with one hand and takes away with another because ultimately we didn't manage to unlock that ambition and to unlock that potential um so yeah uh, the ambition is definitely every party but there needs to be a model in which you put the actual people 
uh, yeah. in first who actually will benefit from the consequences of those of the said action. Um, yeah, well, finally, uh, we're almost at the, at the end. So I will ask you if you could, in no more than two sentences, what is the main takeaway from for our audience members to leave with uh, after this talk? The, the main takeaway, very similar to what I've just said there, Jose, that it's that the, the ambitions there and that we just need more work on making the, the kind of con context that people are operating in more conducive to bring out the, the, the best in people. Um, we're up against it. And a lot of what you're seeing at the minute with innovation, with kind of examples of transformation at, at local levels, it seems to me to be happening in spite of the overall context and the landscape rather than being supported by it so we're doing amazing things even though everything feels like it's to not be conducive and if we can flip that a little bit then i think there really is hope for for a better future and for genuine social and environmental transformation instead of just a half arsed transition away from fossil fuels sorry that wasn't really two sentences but there you have it no, but I think it encapsulates it uh, brilliantly. Uh, Connor, thank you so much for accepting our invitation and sharing the research with us. No, um, thank you for inviting me. Really. And if you are watching this on YouTube, you can find all the resources and materials uh, of this conversation on the Let's Talk About Urban Planning website. Uh, you can also listen to this episode wherever you get your podcasts, subscribe to our newsletter, and follow us on X at Cogitatio LTA. I'm Jose Batista, and I'll see you next week.